the Royal Company of Archers are on hand to protect their monarch. The Queen is in Edinburgh to create Knights of the Order of the Thistle, the premier honour in Scotland. The old order was re-established in 1703, at a time when the monarchy bribed Scotland's nobility to give up their country's independence. There was a good deal of rather unattractive, not rather, but very unattractive, bribery and corruption, not only of, of, of the peerage, but all the way up and down. The Scottish King James VI had united the crowns of Scotland and England and tried to make the union more complete. He had designs for a new British flag drawn up, but his scheme to unite the parliaments of his two kingdoms was shelved. The lack of royal heirs, however, raised the matter of political union again in the 1680s. King William of Orange and his wife Mary were childless. In 1689, the English decided that Mary's sister Anne should succeed them, and the Scots agreed. Queen Anne was pregnant 18 times, but in 1700 her only child and heir died. The English Parliament, without reference to the Scots, decided that when Anne died, their crown would pass to the German House of Hanover. Not bound to the English Act of Succession, the Scots were free to choose a different monarch to succeed Anne, break the union of the crowns. Many Scots MPs felt the time had come to reassert themselves. All of our affairs since the union of the crowns have been managed by the advice of English ministers and the principal officers of the kingdom filled with such men as the court of England knew would be subservient to their designs. By which means they have had so visible an influence upon our whole administration that we have appeared from that time to the rest of the world more like a conquered province than a free, independent people. Oh. The dual monarchy had quite patently failed. And the monarch, the king, the sovereign couldn't be king of both countries and give justice to Scotland. The England being the largest and most powerful got the land share and uh, the it was impossible for the best of monarchs to do anything other than that, I think. Our trade was formerly in so flourishing a condition that the Shire of Fife alone had as many ships as now belong to the whole kingdom. Oh, that 10 or 12 towns which lie to the south coast of that province had in its time a very considerable trade, which in our days are little better than so many heap of ruins. Many Scots, like the Bruces of Curras, supported union for commercial reasons. We'd all suffered from having our cargoes uh, arrested on the high seas by English privateers. And we did a time that was finished. Um, certainly, I think, in their hearts, they felt that it was a sadness, but that commercially it was vital to the country. Upon the union of the crowns, not only all this went to decay, but our money was spent in England and not among ourselves. The furniture for our houses, the best of our clothes and equipage was bought at London. And though particular persons of the Scots nation had many great and profitable places at court to the high displeasure of the English, yet that was no advantage to our country, which was totally neglected. Like a farm managed by servants and not under the eye of the master. Scotland's economic state prior to the Union was deplorable by any standards and it was generally considered to be either the poorest country in Europe or the second poorest. There were some people who thought that uh, Galicia in Poland was poorer but they were a long way away and who knows if they were right or not. At Saint-Germain-en-Laye near Paris, the exiled Stuart court followed the proceedings with interest. 
Scottish nationalist feeling was interpreted as being pro-Jacobite. James VII and II decided to exploit the situation. Chosen to act for him in Scotland was Simon Fraser, who had usurped the chief of Clan Fraser, Lord Lovett. Lord Lovett was described in, in certain history books as a man of contracted understanding. In other words, he was a rather simple fellow. And Simon Fraser of Beaufort, who was just plain Simon Fraser, ingratiated himself with Lord Lovett and went around with him and gradually got him to believe that he was his right-hand man. And even worse than that, he gradually persuaded him to make over the estate. When Lord Lovett's daughter objected to the family intruder, Simon Fraser tried to marry her. She refused. So what did old Simon do then? He went off and grabbed the mother. And she was practically raped and married by force and thrown into bed with pipers drowning her cries. And he was outlawed for that and had to fly to France. Queen Anne never took Lovett's Jacobite plot seriously but stepped up pressure to get the Scots to accept the Hanoverian succession. She instructed her commissioner to the Scots Parliament. As to such of them as you cannot prevail with to concur, you are to endeavour at least to soften them in their opposition, or to get them to be absent. The Scots were not to be easily persuaded, and royal talk of union meant federation, a loose arrangement. This is the only just and rational kind of union. All other coalitions are but the unjust subjection of one people to another. In 1704, the Scots arrested the crew of the English ship, the Worcester, because the English had seized a Scottish vessel when it infringed English trading privileges. The English House of Commons took revenge when the Scots executed the Worcester's captain. After Christmas Day, 1705, all Scots not resident in England were to be regarded as aliens and their exports banned. The English also resorted to military blackmail. The garrisons of England's northern castles, like Carlisle, were put on alert. The local militia armed and trained War between England and Scotland looked possible. Queen Anne, in September 1705, again asked the Scots Parliament to appoint commissioners to treat for union. The leader of the opposition to union, the Duke of Hamilton, now called for a vote in favour of Anne choosing the Scots commissioners. The Duke had found the promise of honours irresistible. After union took place in 1707, Hamilton was given the order of both the thistle and the garter. Well, uh, to be absolutely honest, I don't know that he was promised them before the Union. I do know that he received them afterwards. Um, what is absolutely clear is that while many prominent Scots who voted um, for the Union received very large bribes indeed um, from England. The Campbell Duke of Argyll demanded he be made a Major General. His request granted, he supported union with England. When James Douglas, second Duke of Queensbury, died, he had won an English dukedom for his family and with it an annual pension. He had also received £12,000 of the 20000 Queen Anne secretly paid out to the Scots nobility. One of the few who did not receive a penny was Lord Rosebery. Some authorities say that it was purely for back salaries which were due to um, officers of the Crown in Scotland who had not been paid for some time. Um, the people of the other political party said it was bribes and who pays your money and who takes your choice. The court needed to know who to bribe. Daniel Defoe was sent north to Scotland in October 1706. Defoe was instructed to write propaganda and spy on the Scots by Robert Harley, the Earl of Oxford. You are to use utmost caution that it may not be supposed you are employed by any person in England, but that you came there upon your own business. 
and out of love to the country. You may confidently assure those you converse with that the Queen and all those who have credit with her are sincere and hearty for the Union. You must show them this is such an opportunity that being once lost or neglected is not again to be recovered. England never was before in so good a disposition to make such large concessions or so heartily to unite with Scotland. Defoe was told to send his reports at least once a week to a Mrs. Collins who lived at the Post House, Middle Temple Gate, London. The reports were to be sent anonymously for Harley's attention. Defoe infiltrated Edinburgh society. Even the Kirk accepted him into its confidence. They take me for their friend. <laughs> in the morning, I am at the committee, and in the afternoon, in the assembly, I am privy to all their folly. I wish I could not call it evil. <laughs> and I am entirely confined in it. There were other propagandists in the court's pay, like William Seaton of Pitt Medden, a member of the Scots Parliament, and William Patterson, architect of the Darien Adventure. On the 16th of April, 1706, English and Scottish commissioners began negotiations at Westminster. The terms were swiftly agreed. The Parliament of Great Britain that still meets at Westminster replaced two and the Scots agreed to accept the Hanoverian succession. The English frequently talk of the Parliament of 1707 and subsequent years having taken in, having incorporated Scottish members. Now that is quite fundament fundamentally wrong. What happened in 1707 was that the two existing Parliaments both came to an end. And there was created, after May 1707, a new Parliament of Great Britain, which was a new creation. But the practices of the British Parliament, now as in 1707, are those of the English Parliament, unaltered by union. In 1707, the Scots were to have 45 members in the House of Commons, just one more than the English County of Cornwall. The English made some concessions. The Scottish legal system was to remain, but could be altered by the Parliament of Great Britain. Scottish civil law, however, was not to be changed. The royal boroughs of Scotland were guaranteed their ancient rights and privileges under the treaty. In future, they could trade freely with England and her colonies, but would have to use English currency. The Church of Scotland and the Scottish education system that it nurtured were also guaranteed by the treaty. The Church, generally speaking, was very much for the Union because they were afraid of Jacobitism and they really felt that if they were united with England it would guarantee the continuation of a reformed Church and of course they obtained that. That was the prize, as it were, that was the reward for supporting the Union that the Crown even today guarantees to uphold Presbyterian church government. Prior to uh, being crowned, the sovereign must promise that. Under the terms, the English also offered the Scots a cash payment. At the time of the Act of Union, England had a fairly enormous national debt whereas the Scottish national debt was very, very small and it was felt unfair that future Scottish taxpayers should have to pay uh, a share of, of this national debt so that this sum was paid to Scotland being calculated uh, as being a sum which would recompense them for the extra national debt that they were taking on. The equivalent as the sum was called, amounted to three hundred and ninety-eight thousand and eighty-five pounds ten shillings. If you want to 
a quick description of the equivalent. It was the price for which England bought Scotland. And the reason I say that is that uh, there were all sorts of negotiations on it, but one of the conditions which the commissioners, the English commissioners, were absolutely firm on was that the Company of Scotland must be wound up. And they offered, in return for this, to pay out, out of the equivalent, to pay the shareholders in the Company of Scotland the full amount of their shareholding in the company, plus 5% interest, uh, which was a very generous offer. I think it was one of the reasons why they were ready to look at the Act of Union, because the English said, uh, we'll give you what was called the equivalent, which was to take care of, of some of the losses. It was an overt bribe, but it must have been very effective. I can't say that even I would have necessarily been able to resist it between family bankruptcy and family solvency. It must have come to in a lot of cases. When the Scots people learnt of the terms, there was uproar. In Edinburgh, they took to the streets with the cry, no union. The debate in the Scots Parliament was tense and long. When I consider this affair of the union betwixt the two nations, I find my mind crowded with variety of melancholy thoughts. I think I see a free and independent kingdom delivering up that which all the world has been fighting for since the days of Nimrod. To wit, a power to manage her own affairs by herself without the assistance and counsel of any other. But above all, I see our ancient mother, Caledonia, like Caesar, sitting midst this assembly, ruefully looking about her, covering herself with her royal garment, attending the fatal blow and breathing out her last with an et tu coque mi fili. Those in the pay of the crown claimed a federal union was impossible. It is true that the words federal union are becoming very fashionable and may be handsomely fitted to delude unthinking people. But if any member of this house will give himself the trouble to examine what conditions or articles are understood by these words, or to reduce them into any sort of federal compact whereby distinct nations have been united, I will presume to say they will be found impracticable or of very little use to us. But to put that matter in a clear light, these queries ought to be duly examined. Whether a federal union be practicable betwixt two nations accustomed to monarchical government. Whether the English will accept a federal union, supposing it to be for the true interest of both nations. Whether any federal compact betwixt Scotland and England is sufficient to secure the peace of this island or fortify it against the intrigues and invasions of its foreign enemies. And whether England in prudence ought to communicate its trade and protection to this nation till both kingdoms are incorporated into one. When the mob of Glasgow rioted, Daniel Defoe wrote that the Union was none of their concern. As to all the rest of the Scottish people who have no right to elect representatives, I affirm, and I think the nature of the thing demonstrates it, that they have no right to direct those whom they had no part in constituting. From Scotland's boroughs, petitions poured in against the treaty, 90 in all. Most were an honest reflection of the feelings of many Scots of all classes. The Duke of Argyll suggested they be used to make kites. The 
opposition planned an armed rising. Presbyterians from the southwest were to join forces with Jacobites from the north at the town of Hamilton. From there they would march on Edinburgh and raise the parliament. The Duke of Hamilton was to lead them, but postponed the rendezvous at the last moment. I think the Duke was terrified that there was going to be a very bloody war in Scotland, and I think we can understand this in this present day and age. Hamilton then proposed that a protestation, a plea, should be presented to the monarch. Sir James Stuart, the Lord Advocate, drafted the text. I protest against this union as manifestly tending to subvert that original, fundamental and indissolvable constitution by which the people of this ancient kingdom are joined together in a society amongst themselves. Hamilton had toothache when the day came to present the protestation. Well, I can say, anybody who hasn't had toothache um, obviously doesn't know what an extraordinarily unpleasant and uh, debilitating thing it is. But I think, in fact, the Duke was ill anyway of something more serious. And also, he had a representation from the old pretender who asked him not to oppose the Union. The exiled monarch hoped an unpopular Union might restore him to the throne, but the Scots' opposition lost heart. On the 16th of January, 1707, the act approving the terms was passed. Fletcher bitterly remarked that the country would only be fit for those who had sold it. Crowns and parliaments have remained united, despite the fact that many Scots had their fears realized, like the Earl of Errol, Lord High Constable of Scotland. He mistrusted the English and um, history proves him to be right because they overturned the entire act with their majority in Parliament once we had become a union and changed the entire act and made it worthless. So being against he was correct. At Westminster the Duke of Queensbury presented the Scots Treaty to Queen Anne who had given him a triumphal entry into London. The Queen attended a special service at St Paul's on the 1st of May, 1707 and gave thanks for a union she regarded as the greatest political victory of her reign. The English Parliament, in political terms, had absorbed Scotland. In 1707, it was a patrician bargain, a deal done by two ruling classes with little regard for the mood of the Scottish people. On that first day of union, church bells rang out in Edinburgh too. They played a different tune. How can I be sad upon my wedding day? A lament for independence lost. I think that Scotland is probably the only country in the world that has ever voluntarily surrendered its sovereignty. It was a most extraordinary thing to do, uh, in many ways a tragic thing to do, but I don't blame the people who supported the Union because I can see that it was very difficult for them to decide what to do if they didn't.
On the 18th of August 1945, Scots gathered at Glenfinnan in the Western Highlands to commemorate the bicentenary of the 45, the last Jacobite rebellion. Lord George Murray, Duke of Athol, addressed the crowd. I wear in my bonnet the actual cockade which Lord George Murray wore during the 45. Cameron of Lochiel, whose Episcopalian ancestor supported the four Jacobite rebellions, reassured the audience. I would like to point out that this is no seditious movement, as some people have been kind enough to suggest. Because nowhere in the British Empire could you find more loyal subjects of his present majesty, King George VI, than in the Highlands of Scotland. Yeah.